Hello, we're going to look at different ways of showing ionic compounds. And we've looked in detail at how, how ionic compounds are formed. But there are different ways of representing them. And we're going to look at the positives, but also the limitations of the different diagrams. The first one we have is our dot and cross diagram. And we've done that previously in another video. And the good thing about dot and cross diagrams is that they really show us or show us quite well how the electrons behave when an ionic bond is formed. It shows us where the electrons come from, where they go to, and how the ions are formed and how we get that electrostatic attraction between the ions. Only problem is with this, we've only got two ions shown here. And in fact, ionic compounds are pretty much all giant ionic lattice structures, or we say they all have a giant lattice structure. So this doesn't actually show all the different ions that might be interacting to form the structure. And of course, this is two dimensional and the actual ionic compounds are three dimensional in real life. We can actually do a better two dimensional diagram that looks a bit like this. We've seen this a couple of times before. And the good thing about this diagram is that it shows how the ions are arranged in the compound, in this case it's sodium chloride. So it shows the arrangement of the ions. It shows that they alternate in rows and in columns, but it doesn't actually show the structure is really three dimensional and it doesn't show the attraction in all directions. So it can go left, right, up and down, but actually if it was 3D, we would know that the attraction between the ions is in all directions not just left, right, up and down. And of course, the ions are not solid circles. They are made of a nucleus and electrons in their different shells. This diagram shows them as solid circles and sometimes they're drawn as solid spheres. They're given a slight 3D shape, but they're still drawn in one single flat layer. Okay, so we can highlight the two types of diagrams we've looked at so far. We've got the dot and cross diagram and the two dimensional diagram. We can now look at um, what we call a three-dimensional ball and stick diagram. So this is getting closer to what they actually look like in real life. Ionic compounds look like in real life. The great positive about this is that it shows a 3D structure, not just a 2D structure, and show and so you can see how the attraction is uh, left and right, up and down, and also backwards uh, and forwards as well, into the diagram and out of the diagram as well. Problem is, with this diagram is that the ions are actually closer together. There aren't actually lines or sticks joining the ions together. There are electrostatic forces of attraction. And again, the ions are not solid spheres. So we can go one step further with our three-dimensional closed, close packed diagram, which looks a bit like that. Now, this is very useful. It has a couple of positive points as well, because it shows, that, again, the 3D structure. It shows that the ionic compound is a giant lattice and not just a flat structure. It's a giant lattice and it's 3D. And you can also imagine that we've got attraction in all directions. Problem is it is quite difficult to see the, the 3D arrangement clearly. There's a lot of ions you can't see in that diagram. And again, the ions are not solid spheres. So we've got various ways of representing ionic compounds, all the way from a dot and cross diagram to 3D a structure showing how the ionic compounds are lattice and not just flat 2D structures. Um, but there are limitations, but we still, still at the same time have to use these models in order for us to be able to understand how ionic compounds actually uh, work and how they are structured. So the next thing I want to visit in this video is calculating the empirical formula for ionic compounds. So in the empirical formula, that's a key term. What does it actually mean? Well, when we write an, empir an empirical formula for a compound, we are showing the simplest ratio of atoms that are in that compound. The simplest ratio of atoms in that compound. In this case, it's actually going to be ions because we're dealing with ionic compounds. However, just to give us an example, look at this compound here. It's C2H6, methane, ethane, I believe that is. And if we drew out the actual molecule, it might be arranged a bit like this. So two carbons and six hydrogens. That's what the actual molecule looks like, but that's not the empirical formula. That's not the simplest ratio of atoms. If you worked out the simplest ratio of atoms, it would be C1H6. We don't need to write the one for the C. And this would be our empirical formula for that compound above. That's actually an, a covalent compound, not an ionic, an ionic one, but I'm just using it as an example. So 
how might we need to use this idea with our ionic compounds? Well, here we've got chloride ions and sodium ions together. Again, this is sodium chloride, quite a common example we use. But we've got 11 chloride ions and 11 sodium ions. And you might be tempted to call this Na11Cl11 because 11 of each ion. But actually, that's not how we would write it. The simplest ratio is 1 to 1, so we'd write it as NaCl. So that's the correct empirical formula for that diagram above. What about this one here? Well, here we have magnesium ions and we have chloride ions again. But this time we've got four magnesium for every eight chloride ions. And again, you might be tempted to write Mg4Cl8, but that's not the correct empirical formula. We could cancel that down, the four and the eight, and we'd have MgCl2. And this is the correct empirical formula for the ionic compound that is magnesium chloride. Okay, so the key here is to remember that the empirical formula means the simplest ratio of atoms or ions in the diagram that you're seeing. So it'd be a question of working out the number of ions of each substance you have and working out the simplest ratio. Okay, so that's two things we've covered. The limitations of the different types of diagram for ionic compounds and the empirical formula. We have just one more video to do for ionic compounds, so I'll get on with that one now. But other than that, for this video, we're all done. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.